Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences presents its 35th Annual Achievement Awards. These people, like most of us, are movie fans. From all over the country, they've come to the Civic Auditorium here in Santa Monica, California, for a glimpse of their favorite actors, as the most famous faces in the world arrive to attend Oscar's annual coming out party. The suspense has begun to mount as some of Hollywood's most glamorous last-minute elite rush into the theater in time for the overture. There's Jack Lord of Stony Burke. Eva Marie Saint. There's little Patty Duke. Miss Lee Remick with husband Bill Collar. There's Bob Stack and Mrs. Stack, an established star in pictures before his success in The Untouchables. And Gregory Peck, a nominee this year for his work as Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. Miss Sophia Loren, an Academy Award winner last year for two women. And there's Ginger Rogers. Danny Thomas, one of the best-loved men in the entertainment world. And there's Joan Crawford, one of the immortals of filmdom. And Edward G. Robinson, all bearded. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for this evening, Frank Sinatra. Funny thing happened to me last time I was in Washington, which incidentally was quite a while ago. I was passing the National Gallery, I guess you might call it an art house. And all the way around the block was a tremendous line of people right waiting to get in to see a little Italian picture called uh, 
the Mona Lisa. Uh, my first reaction was, go fight it. These Italian picture makers have been knocking our brains out for years. My second reaction was, I wondered how come that three centuries later they were still lining up to see a picture, not widescreen, doesn't even move or talk. The chick just sits there and smiles. Well, not even smiles, she kind of smiles. Now, how come they're still lining up to see it? I'm still not sure, but maybe, maybe it's because the Mona Lisa represents one man's personal vision, a picture he had to make, not something turned out on an assembly line because the Italian painting industry needed product, but a picture he had to make so badly his brushes hurt. Actually, a marvelous thing is beginning to happen to us here. Other mediums have come along that can turn out assembly line product, English translation junk, faster and cheaper and better than we can. And whether we like it or not, if we want to compete, we're being forced back into the Mona Lisa business ourselves. And we're beginning to find out it's a pretty nice business to be in. Only a couple of years ago, say, if Leonardo da Vinci had wanted to make the Mona Lisa out here, he might have had a few problems here and there. For instance, the scene of producer's office. Da Vinci enters and explains he's got an idea for a picture. A beautiful woman, he says, sitting there smiling. Well, not exactly smiling, kind of smiling. <clears throat> he finishes and then there's a long silence. Finally, the producer speaks. Well, he says, uh, I don't know, but it does have a great part for a girl. <laughs> now, if we can get somebody to pose for it, Liz, maybe, or Ingrid, or Doris, or even Anne Margaret. Some kind of a name like that. You know, Leonardo, baby, I like it. I really like it. And we might even change the title to Mona and Lisa. <laughs> Pick up some of the odd house crowd that way, see? <laughs> da Vinci gulps, but he's got a house in Brentwood, three kids, and an analyst to support. Why should he argue about it? Now the producer's really getting warmed up. We've got a picture here, he says. We've really got a picture. Now all you've got to do, Leonardo baby, is just paint a guy in there looking over her shoulder, see? We get Rock or Greg or Tony or somebody to pose for it, just for a love interest. And the motivation, we've got to clean that up. I mean, you just can't have a dame sitting there smiling. You've got to tell the audience what she's smiling about. Leonardo, sweetheart, if I were making this picture, which I am, I'd paint in some big kind of a cocktail party scene in the foreground, give it some production value. It's a flashback, see? She's smiling and thinking about the decadent life she used to lead before she, uh, I don't know, joined a Peace Corps or something. <laughs> anyway, that's how they made Mona and Lisa for $8 million, opened it at the music hall where it bombed out for obvious reasons, and six months later they sold it to television. Now, obviously, this little story is not true. Nothing like that could happen here. <laughs> hey, the truth, the happy truth, is that many of the pictures and artists we're honoring here tonight are already in the Mona Lisa business, making pictures because they, as artists, want to make them, because they have to make them so badly their cameras and their typewriters and their eyebrow pencils hurt. And as I said, it's a pretty nice business to be in. And now that I've gotten this message off my massive chest, let us make the evening official. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences, Mr. Wendell Corey. <laughs> Good evening. The Academy's Board of Governors proudly welcomes you all to our 35th annual awards. We are proud of the pictures we will honor this evening and of the people who will announce these honors. Every presentation will be made by a former Oscar winner tonight. Most of them are here in the auditorium. Some you will see on film from Europe. As always, the announcement we make here create headlines everywhere. For this event is the culmination of a year's work that has involved the hearts of millions. Those of us who are paid to make these films, and those of you who, God bless you, pay to see them. Now, happily for us, most 
More of you have been beguiled by the imagination, vigor, and artistry of this, of this year's films than ever before. Now let's see if you agree with the more than 2,500 members of the Academy who have voted by secret ballot. The accounting house of Price Waterhouse tabulated these ballots. The final results were compiled by one gentleman who at this moment is approaching with the information that he and he alone knows, Mr. Bill Miller. Waterhouse has tabulated the official ballots, and the results are in the sealed envelopes. Thank you, Bill. In a few moments, the former Oscar winner will turn to Mr. Miller and say, the envelope, please. So don't go too far, Bill. To introduce that Oscar winner here again is our master of ceremonies, the distinguished art critic, Mr. Frank Sinatra. A recent lecturer in the cloistered halls of Harvard University is a young lady who won her letter on the sound stages of Hollywood in the great academic tradition of Emerson and Lowell. The Oscar winner for her performance in the diary of Anne Frank, Miss Shelley Winters. <laughs> Augustibus. That means thank you, I think, in Latin. I'll check with my druggist. I'll be right up there. <laughs> Tonight, students of the cinema are all you people out there who pay to go to the movies. We will start with two categories. The first is best achievement in sound. Now, a famous director, Mr. George Stevens, once explained to me that movies were mostly visual and sound in television was mostly audio due to the size of the viewing screen. But nowadays, when you make a movie, you're not sure if or when it's going to end up on television. So you see, a sound man has not only to be a artist and craftsman, but he has to be something of a prophet as well. So in our category of sound and prophets, we have five nominees. They are Walt Disney Studio Sound Department for Bon Voyage. Shepherd and Studio Sound Department for Lawrence of Arabia. Warner Brothers Studio Sound Department for Meredith Wilson's The Sound of Music. Oh, The Music Man. <laughs> uh, Universal City Studio Sound Department for That Touch of Mink. And Glen Glen Sound Department for Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. The envelope, please, Mr. Miller. The winner is Shepherd and Studio Department for Lawrence of Arabia. Accepting for the Shepherd and Studio Sound Department of Mr. John Cox is Robert Wagner. Mr. Bob Wagner accepting. On behalf of John Cox, Columbia Pictures, my friends David Lane and Sam Spiegel, I'm very proud and very pleased to accept this award. Thank you. The best way to define special effects, which is our category number two, is um, sort of the pictures that cost the most money. First, the longest day. Visual effects by Robert McDonald and audible effects by Jacques Maman. The second nominee is Mutiny on the Bounty. Visual effect by Arnold Gillespie. Audible effects by Milo Lori. And now for the winner. The winners are Robert McDonald and Jacques Maman for The Longest Day. Accepting for Robert McDonald and Jacques Momo, Ivan Martin. This is very hard for an actress to let go of. On behalf of Mr. Robert McDonald and Mr. Momo, 
My thanks and appreciation to the camera. Thank you.